Not on. Oh, there I go. Man, it's always that second button. <laughs> has he won your heart? Yes, he has. Come on now, really. Yes, he has. Yes, he has. Yes, he has. Yes. We'll just leave these up here as you feel led this morning. I just can't, I don't feel like interrupting things. Amen. And I'm all hot out up here. It's, uh, so uh, as you feel led, you guys know what to do. And that's okay. Help me here. Help me, guys. Putting them together today. Turn me down. <laughs> Putting them together today, Charlie. <laughs> Testing. One, two. Test, test. <clears throat> Has he won your heart? I'm going to have to change the title of this sermon now. Has he won your heart? Won my heart. Won my heart. It's a perfect picture here in Matthew chapter 25. Let's turn there. Matthew 25. Still ringing, huh? You gonna get it, <laughs> Doctor Chuck? <laughs> operate on that. No, we pray over that sound system this morning. Amen. Yeah. All right, in Jesus' name. We want you to be clear and concise this morning, Jesus. Thank we want your word to cut us, sharper than a double-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints in marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of our hearts. Can we say this morning that you have won our hearts? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Has he won your heart? You and all the world will know if he's won your heart by the choices you have made this week. By the words that we have spoken this week, look back in the, the short term of your past and see some of the things you've done, some of the things you've said, some of the choices you've made. Has He won your heart? Matthew 25. Uh, I thought I was going to be doing something different this morning, and when I woke up this morning, I was uh, frantic in the spirit. <laughs> frantic in the spirit <laughs> in the sense that um, we weren't going to do what we were supposed to what I thought we were supposed to do and that's okay, amen, amen. because we always want to be led <coughs> of the spirit amen. it doesn't matter where we are or what we're doing amen. and some of us have a real good time on Sundays to do that but when we go home we just kind of forget that that's really church So I think this picture that we've been talking about in Matthew 25 for a few weeks, I've been really wrestling with it. And, and normally when I'm doing a summary of, of things like we've been doing in Matthew, uh, there's not a whole lot of wrestling because we're just kind of looking at it from an overview. But uh, as some of the Tuesday night and Wednesday night Bible scholars uh, know, uh, I've been wrestling with chapter 25. <laughs> So I thought, well, what better way to wrestle than with brethren and sistren? <laughs> and we can wrestle together so that we could cry out together and respond together in the awesome name of Jesus. Woo! Uh, it is the Kingdom Picture Series. We're looking at what the kingdom looks like. Uh, so if where uh, Jesus is, there's the kingdom, and if uh, his disciples are of the kingdom, and the disciples are to look like their king, and his kingdom looks like heaven, then wherever he is and ever wherever we are, then we should also look like the king and the kingdom, living out in the kingdom, in this dark and dying world. Yes. Uh, 
Uh, Matthew 25, we're going to look at part of Matthew 25 this morning. The whole uh, summary title of Matthew 25, we're going to call it The Sword. The Sword we've been going through from chapter 10 through the end of chapter 28. And uh, each summary has uh, started with the letter S, so we're not going to change it now. You get extra points for doing that, Pastor. Yeah. And uh, so chapter 25, we're going to look in particular, I'm going to read you verses 1 through 13, this parable of the ten virgins. And we're going to concentrate on the first few verses this morning. Well, let's go ahead and look at the first uh, of the first parable. Let's look at the story in its context. Matthew 25, starting in verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins, who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the kingdom, the bridegroom is coming. Go to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest you should, there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the virgins, other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Lord Jesus, would you somehow, some way? Speak your truth to us this morning. Yes, Lord. As we feast on you and your word. And do you really have our hearts? Have you won our hearts? In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. So one of the titles I had this morning was uh, Cooking with Oil. I thought we'd be feasting and on Jesus and His Word. I'm always thinking about eating and cooking and and uh, those kind of things. So cooking with oil, we see in the first few verses, there's this thought about what's going on with this oil. So let me propose this morning to you that in these first few verses that you were created to be fed with oil. You were created to be fed with oil. If our, our one and only purpose is to be one with Jesus, then in that purpose, we are to be fed with oil. Let's look and see what that means this morning. Uh, so beginning in chapter 25 again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to these ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the, the bridegroom. And Jesus says that five were wise and, and five were foolish. So these, there's these ten virgins, and, and we think, well, hey, there, there's ten of them, and they're virgins, so that's a good thing, isn't it? Yeah. But there's a, a choice that's going on here. Point one on your, on your outline. If you didn't get one, it's up front here. If you need one, raise your hand if you want to follow along with an outline. But point one is your choice. You need one right here? They're right there on the front seat. Thank you. Your choice of oil. The choice. Well, the choice is wise or unwise. Five have chosen to be wise and five have chosen to be foolish, it seems. When you get into, I spent a lot of time in Proverbs last year, in particular with our school, and boy, Proverbs is certainly the book of wisdom. And when you think about being wise... Proverbs is, is very clear. Uh, you begin the, the very first chapter of Proverbs and you see verse 7 of, cha of Proverbs. The, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So there is, there is an absolute 
contrast between these wise and those who are foolish or unwise. The ones who are foolish have no wisdom whatsoever, and those who are wise have wisdom. <laughs> How astounding is that? But it begins with the fear of the Lord. It begins with a relationship, a personal, intimate relationship with the Lord. That's the fear of the Lord. It's not the cowering fear. It's not the, is he going to strike me with a lightning bolt fear? It's not a greasy grace kind of fear. Well, he's going to love me anyway, so I can go ahead and live how I want, when I want, do what I want, when I want. Yeah, he's going to love you anyway. And yeah, there's nothing you can do that's going to stop God from loving you. But that doesn't give you an excuse to continue to live in sin. Amen. Is that clear? That's right. I'm just telling you what it says here. <clears throat> Not my opinion. I tried to live my, by my opinion for 29 some years. <laughs> and it left me with one foot in hell and another one on a banana peel. And that's what it got me. A lot of scars, a lot of bruises, a lot of hurt, a lot of pain. I was living in that, uh, brother mentioned this morning, that curse. I was living in that curse. Whoa. But when he won my heart, he broke the curse. Amen. The cross is a definite curse breaker. Yes. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. And as you continue to go through the course of the book of, I like to spend all day with you in Proverbs, but you'd see this wisdom. And you'd find out when you got done reading all 31 chapters of Proverbs, you'd come away with the thought that Jesus is my wisdom. Woo! And without him there is no wisdom. That's right. And I cannot be wise in my own eyes. It's, uh, what, uh, Proverbs says, there's a way that seems right to man. But that way leads to hell. So there's this interesting choice here. Why, why are five chosen to be wise and five chosen to be foolish? Five are wise, five are Foolish, and, and what is the wise and foolish thing that's going on here? Well, the wise thing is that, is that five of them have chosen to bring oil with them. And five chose not to bring oil with them. Now, both brought their lamps, it says. But only five brought this oil. Now we could spend all day again on this idea of wise and foolish, but we're, really, we're just kind of in the summary stages. So let's see if we can really just see this big picture here. Five are wise, five are foolish. Look at the wording that how Jesus states what's going on here. He says, those who were foolish took their lamps. Well, you should take your lamp. Amen. Their focus was on the lamp. But the wise, it says, took oil. And you, would you take oil and not bring your lamp? Probably not. So you see where the, the focus is here. The wise are preparing. The wise are, just in case, the wise are really wise. Something's going on inside of these five wise uh, virgins. And something is not going on inside of these foolish ones. The thought is this idea of container. The container of oil. Of course, we know here that the tra anybody have a different translation besides lamp? Vessel. Well, I like that. Yeah, because if you were created to be fed with oil, then guess what? You are a vessel of this oil, a vessel of the Holy Spirit. Would you go there with me? Yes, you would. And the house of God. You are the house of God. That's right. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. 
So this container of oil, better translated than lamp, is torch. Whoa. A torch. Now, we used to sing a song a lot, especially in vacation Bible school. We used to sing, This Little Light of Mine, I'm Going to Let It Shine. Remember that song? Yeah. You all know that one, right? Yeah. And we used to teach the kids to wave their finger up like this. And some of you grew up in the 70s, you threw out your lighters real quick, and then we knew when you grew up, so you'd be doing this. <laughs> then I got to thinking, This Little Light of Mine, I'm Going to Let It Shine. And I'm thinking... How about... Kids, let's sing this big flaming torch of mine. I'm going to let it shine. When you think of the torch, the torch is this vessel of this oil. And the torch needs and is lit by the oil. And the torch cannot light unless it is filled with the oil. There was an example over in John 18 about this. See if we can find it. Again, this is uh, this is stretching me this morning. John 18, verse 3. It's the same torch, same word that's mentioned here in John 18. And get this picture of the light that was coming. Verse 3. Then Judas received... Having received a detachment of troops and officers, this is that guy Judas we talked about before, remember? Judas is guiding here. He received this detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees. They came with lanterns, torches, same word, torches and weapons. So I, I think of that picture sometimes as I, as I think of the old uh, black and white movie. I think they were going to chase down, uh, who were they chasing? The, the, um, I'm trying to think. Was it Frankenstein they were chasing? They came, or was it, uh, who was the guy from, no the hunchback of Notre Dame? Remember, they all came with the peep, the town. They just came, with, this is that picture, right, with Judas leading the way. They're going around. They got this small group, and they got their, their torches, and they got their, you know... Yeah. Pitchforks. Yeah, man, pitchforks and the whole nine yards, and they're going to they're gonna try to give somebody a smackdown. That's the picture. Well, we don't really get that picture here with these ten virgins because, well, you know, we think this, we think this prim and proper thing is going on here. You know, the bridegroom is, is coming, and... Uh, you know, what's going to happen here? But, but the picture of this lamp, which is really this torch, is really significant. Because the key is that a, a torch is made to be fed with oil. And, and the torch, if it's not fed with oil, wouldn't be serving its purpose. We sang the song, uh, how did it go, Chuck, about complete, uh, you are complete. We said the word complete. You complete me. How, how was that? Who remembers what we just sang? I am made, made complete. So you're, you're being what you were created to be. We like to translate that word, that word as perfect. Yeah. It's a Christian perfection. The world tells us, tells the church, the church has gotten into this and said, well, we can't be perfect. But yes, we're not we talking can. about a perfect ten. Woo! We know that because we were born with this curse, this bend towards sin, that the cross can break. Yeah. And the perfection comes when you are brought back into right relationship, being what you're created to be. When Paul says he's coming back for his church without a spot or wrinkle, do you really think he's wondering about if my tie's on straight? Where is the spot and where is the wrinkle he's referring to? Right he's won my heart. Yes. yes. Praise God. Yes. yes. So if the key for a torch is 
that it's made to be fed with oil, then so there a Christian was made to be fed with oil. You'd be made to be fed with the oil. Oil of gladness. The oil. Symbolic of the Holy Spirit. Praise you, Lord. So I couldn't help but ask myself the question, what, what have I been feeding on? John chapter 5 John the Baptist makes the statement that there's one mightier than me who is coming. And in that, Jesus makes this statement about John the Baptist in 535 when he says he was the burning and shining lamp and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light talking about John the Baptist and of course John pointed to Jesus John was the forerunner John was the the pave maker or the pave wave pave waver waver pave maker paver he paved the way for Jesus. He paved the way. See, it's not that... Well, hopefully you're thinking, well, what about that verse in Matthew 5? What about that verse that says, you are the light? See, you're not the vessel, but the oil fills the vessel. And he's not saying that John is the light. John's not the light. John had the light in him. Matter of fact, John had the light in him before he was born. Amen. When his mother was filled with the Holy Spirit, what happened to John? He was filled with the Holy Spirit. Right. And when Jesus says in, in Matthew 5 that you are the salt, you are the light, you're not the light, but the light lives in you, which makes you the light. Well, you're not the light, but the light is in you. And the light's so bright we can't see you, we can only see the light. Wow. The problem is sometimes we think well, we're the light. I'm the light. Praise God. Oh, you know where I go to church. The light. You know where I go. We're the only ones that really know. Praise God. We're the only ones that really have some good worship. Praise God. And the reason why we come together at this South Campus together with churches together is that to prove that it's not about churches, it's about the church. Amen. The church is to be the light. Right. And how are we the light? Well, you can't be the light without the light. Yes. The oil to fill the light. You're the vessel. So these five were wise and these five were foolish. The foolish took their lamp. See, the focus was on the lamp. They took the lamp. And it's really important to understand this, this taking is this receiving. And we even try to change the wording so we understand it. You don't know how many times we get up here that we're going to take the offering. I said, well, I gotta, we gotta, it sounds a little political. <laughs> it sounds a little have to. So we want to receive. We want to receive the offering. Giving of yourself. <laughs> We sang about that this morning. I couldn't have told you which song's better to pick this morning, Chuck. He had no idea, and I had no idea until this morning when I woke up what was I going to really preach because I had the whole idea set up. It's in that notebook there. <laughs> to receive. They, they received. They, the relationship of these unwise, these foolish virgins, was the focus was on the lamp. The torch. The wise ones, it says in verse 4, took oil. So this idea, I man, you can look at this so many different ways. That, that this wisdom that they received, the five wise ones received this wisdom because the bridegroom has won their heart. And the other five, he hadn't won their heart yet. 
It's like saying, well, ten people showed up at church this morning. Five were wise and five were unwise. Five were wise, five were foolish. Well, would you five foolish ones raise your hand? Just one. Okay. See, not five are going to, one may, but five won't raise their hands. So, because I mean, we were getting all wrapped up in this, well, well, they're virgins. You know, and the definition in, in the Hebrew, a great definition for a virgin is one who is untouched. One who is prepared. And, and I got to thinking, well, what about, what? And I asked Jordan this morning, I said, what's this deal? Why do we call, uh, that's okay, it's just all over, off his chair. Praise the Lord. He, <laughs> this, sorry for you looks, so I better talk about it for a second. Anyway, back up here. Okay, so Whoa. this idea of virgin olive oil. Yeah. Well, it's the, it's the first, get it, the first fruits, the first pressing of the olives that makes it virgin. There is the least or no impurities in the oil that makes it virgin. Now, if I take that virgin olive oil and I put it in my diesel truck, I'm going to have a problem. Because I'm not using that oil for what it was created to be. I'm not putting that oil in the proper container. Praise God. So it's not just good enough that I have this virgin olive oil. It's not good and just good enough that you come and hang out at church, although we do want you to be here. It's not just good enough that you give your money, although we really need you to give your money. It's not just that. <laughs> Whoa. But do you understand that there'd be a, a complete difference, a transformation yes. in and through you, is if you would now do those things after he's won your heart? Yes. 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 Sometimes we can put the cart before the horse. Right. Sometimes we can put church membership before the cross. Yes. Yes. What? Amen. Ooh. Yes. Well, I go to church. God. Well, I sing in the choir. I wear a tie. I never used to wear a tie, but doesn't that mean I'm different? Has he won your heart? When he wins your heart, then the transformation begins. Yes. Five, five hearts were won. Five hearts were not. So what's this whole purpose? So the purpose of the oil is what? Well, the idea of the, the summary of Matthew 25 is this sword. We're calling it the sword because we found that if you get to the end of chapter 25, there's this word in verse 32 that says that all nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from his goats. So the sword separates, the sword divides. Ephesians 6, 17. I wish I had, put, had time to put all this on your paper for you. I apologize, but just you can blame Jesus, not me. Amen. <laughs> Ephesians 6, 17. Put that under number three there, the purpose of oil. 6, 17 tells us about the sword of the Spirit. My brother talked about it this morning, about the full armor of God. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. Well, what's the sword of Spirit? The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. Amen. And somebody already said it this morning about knowing God and His Word. I think Pastor Angie was saying it. Well, you want to know Jesus, you've got to know His Word. The two are not separate. That's right. There is a, a, relationship, a relationship between the, the living Word and the written Word. Yes. There's this intimacy of relationship. So the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. That makes sense. Yeah. Especially when it's in the Bible. And in Matthew chapter 10, when we started Matthew 10, back there, we saw this picture of the church. And this is why we call this whole thing the Kingdom Picture Series. Because these five wise virgins are giving you a picture of those in the church are taken up by the bridegroom. 
The five wise, it says what? The door was shut, man. I don't know you. So in Matthew 10, verse 34, Jesus said, Do not, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. We have a hard time with that one, don't we? Amen. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. It's not that he's not the God of peace, because we know he's the God of peace. We understand that. But what the sword does, is the sword divides the sheep from the goats, the wise from the foolish. The Word of God does that. The Holy Spirit does that. And then, of course, you can't help but not go to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, which we've already said once today. This purpose, the sword... Hebrews 4.12. And I always like to start up in verse 10 because when he's won your heart, there's this peace and there's this rest that comes upon you and in you and through you. And that, of course, is our whole focus for 2013, we said. Jesus asked the question, what do you want me to do in and through you? And that question should be on the tip of your tongue, the first thought and the last thought, all the day long. You run into Publix, you got two items, that lady cuts in front of you with 35 items, and you're in the express line. Lord Jesus, what do you want to do in and through me right now? Well, I bet you you could talk to her about someone. And either she will be wise or foolish in her response. And she probably will never go on the express line again with 35 items. And she might just give her heart to Jesus because you're the light. Well, you're not the light, but the light's in you. Amen. You understand that? I have to look at things like that now because I have to look at things differently. Because it all has to do with his purpose in my life. Because the things that go on just this morning. So it's so important we have to be one. I'm ready to back out of the driveway and there's a, there's a spray bottle behind the van. Well, I'll stop rushing. Why, why? Is it because somebody put it there to get me mad? No. I would look at it before like that. But it's to remind me of my focus. It's like, preacher, you preach it, you've got to live it. That's right. So verse 9, in, uh, back to Hebrews 4. There, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. This is called an active rest. Active rest. Which means what? It's not a rest where you come in every Sunday and we, we're going to take all these seats out, Pastor, and put Lazy Boy recliners in here. And then when you come in on Sunday, you say we have to rest, Pastor, and I've had a rough week. And we say on the counter, everybody jacks their seat back and they're all going to hear the snoring for an hour and a half. That's not this rest. This is an active rest. A rest where you're doing things that you're not in control of. That's amen. This means amen. Okay. Yeah. It's a rest where you're doing things that you're not in control of. Okay. It's a rest that he's doing things in and through you. And it's so clear. Ask my wife. She knows. It's so clear when he's not and when he is. When I'm allowing him and when I'm not allowing him. For he who has entered his rest for you. This is you now. Small letter H, right? For you who have entered his rest. His rest is through the 
cross, so you can't go around the cross. In order to receive this rest, you must go to the cross, to the cross, through the cross. Paul says what? I've been crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live. Christ now lives in me. And the life I now live in this flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20. That's part of this rest. For he who has entered his rest, for you who have entered his rest, has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Now for some reason we've painted this picture of this Sabbath rest and this rest in particular in Hebrews as this rest of we just we get the biggest fluffiest pillow we can and we just catch a few Z's. Man's first day of existence was the day that God talks about this rest. And it wasn't while well, it hit the snooze to stay, stay, stay in bed till noon. It was, you cease from your own works, God works in and through you. And when in time you get to Genesis chapter 3, you see what? That man and woman have chosen to do their own works. And then the fall. They were no longer being what they were created to be. So the purpose, if the torch, if we were created to be fed with the Holy Spirit, with this oil, that's the purpose of the torch, then the Christian was made to be fed with this oil as well. Uh, back to the Matthew 25. So the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to these ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise, five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered. And slept. See, they didn't really know the day or the hour, which is what he says in verse 13. You don't know the day or the hour. So part of making disciples, part of being a disciple is, is this idea of being ready. Now, isn't it interesting that the world now has, there's a lot of things out there now about you being ready. we got preppers, right, about being ready. People, remember when, when uh, Y2K came around? Whoop, the... Canned food items were falling off the shelves. I still have some. <laughs> right? We may prepare. The world's screaming, prepare. The end is near. <coughs> so what are we screaming? Not just go stick your head in the sand. Not just get your light and run for your cover. It's who are we sharing this rest with. It's because this is what he's talking about. These five that were wise, they weren't all upset and worried that the bridegroom was, was delayed. They were slumbering and, and sleeping. And then the cry came out that the bridegroom was coming. We got our oil. We got our lamps. Let's go. But the ones who weren't ready, well, where's our oil? Why didn't you bring it? Well, see, because you really weren't, maybe you really weren't thinking that the bridegroom was coming. Maybe you had an idea what time you said, thought he was coming. You know, and if, if Jesus, if you don't come back by this certain time, I'm going to do my own thing. Done that? Been there? I'll give you till 12. 12 o'clock, preacher, I'm done. Right? So the, mid, mid, the midnight cry was heard, and behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. 
Then all those arose, trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us. You go, you, but you go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with them to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But surely I say to you, I do not know you. Matthew seven twenty one. It's not the first time we read a, a statement like this. Of all the places in the Sermon on the Mount, as Jesus comes to the close of, of the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about this narrow gate, this separating from the narrow and the wide, the wide way. The wide way, the wide gate, as broad as the way that leads to destruction. That's a wisdom statement. You can go to Proverbs and find something just exactly like that. There are many who go in that way. No, nobody makes them go that way. They choose to, to go that way. Verse 14, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. And here's that warning again, verse 15, But beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree would be a wise tree. A bad tree would be a foolish tree. Every tree that, that does not bear fruit is what? Does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. And then verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does, better translated for us today, he who is the will of God, the will of my Father in heaven. This is such a dividing statement, isn't it? It's such a sword-like statement. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Some folks think because they prophesy that they're all that in a bag of chips. Yeah. Have we not cast out demons in your name? Well, didn't you see what we did? Did I tell you the time I casted out these 10,000 demons? Yeah. Uh, don't worry about the word. Let's, let me tell you about my story. Mm. And done many wonders in your name. We must be careful of what we ask for. Asking is to pray. Now, yes, we want signs and wonders to happen. But there was a guy who asked for a sign, who needed a sign. He got his sign. Yep. Stuck him out under his little tree somewhere. Whoa. Put him in the belly of a fish for a while. There's some signs. Some of us have received signs and we're wondering, why has this happened to me? It's right here. Praise God. So just because we say we're virgins, just because we are, we say we're Christians, just because we hang out at church, just because, just because, just because, fill in the blank, just because, has He won your heart? Yes. Has He won your heart? Verse 23, And then I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, is them, 
I will liken him to a wise man. There you are. Woo! Who has built his house on the rock. And you guys know the rest. Thank you, Jesus. Built it on the rock. The foolish one built it on the sand. So I guess what we should do then is we have two rows here. We just need to have a couple signs, Pastor Nancy. Over here we'll put the... Sheep. Wise or foolish? Sheep. Oh, wise over here and foolish over here. Now when we come in... We get to sit. <laughs> Would that help? <laughs> I mean, if you want some division to go on, let's get some real division going on. Don't fight about the color of the carpet. Don't fight about the music. Don't be divided over something so superficial. Let's be divided by the word. Yeah. Woo! And then we'll know if we're wise or foolish. And then we'll yeah. know the sheep versus the goats. Yes. And then we'll know the Christians from the the lovers of God and the... If we're going to be divided, let's really be divided. <laughs> Woo! And then once we're divided, we're one. I came to bring a sword. Let me show you a picture real quick. Last point, the taste test of oil. Taste test. When it down, just put some more oil in it. Olive oil. It's good for you. Doesn't taste right, just send me some more oil. The taste test of oil. Some of you have been praying these two scriptures this, since uh, Wednesday. I appreciate that. Uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Verses Acts chapter 7, verse 54. The taste test of oil. See, so you talked, we, we read about the fruit, right? The producing the fruit. Well, the taste test of the oil is the same thing. When you got into that express aisle and she did cut in front of you, your taste, the taste test of your oil is going to come out. How you respond in that situation is going to scream loud and clear if he's got your heart or not. The test just doesn't come to upset you. The test comes to prove you. Doesn't James say that? My brethren... Count it all joy. Joy. When you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience or perseverance. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete Lacking nothing. Whoa. So if somebody's told you that just come up to an altar, pray this prayer, give us your money, join the church, and everything's going to be hunky-dory, they have lied to you. Because the moment he wins your heart and you go to the cross, whoo! and you become a bleeding, suffering, dying, resurrected disciple, guess what's going to happen? You're going to be transformed. Just like your Lord, you're going to be come on now, you're going to be yes you are. And tempted. And persecuted. And bleeding. John the Baptist Suffer. baptizes Jesus. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He goes out into his public ministry. Who's the first one to attack him? The last temptation of Christ. Yeah. Come on. Why would we think anything different? This isn't some club. Is church some club?
Church is a, a oneness, is a, an abiding, is a remaining, is a clinging to Jesus and His Word. Yes. In each other. Oswald Chambers uses this great word. He says, uh, I'll paraphrase. Basically, when I come to Christ, I become a doormat for others. <laughs> a doormat. A doormat. To wipe dirty, stinking feet on. Is that your picture of the church? Because that's the picture I see in the scripture. So anyway, back to this taste test of oil. Closing with this here. Taste test of oil. Acts 2.37. Here's this group of people. Uh, Peter has just been, and the gang have been in the upper room. They've been filled with the Holy Spirit. And Peter comes out, and the others come out of the upper room. And there's this uh, group that's amazed, in verse 12, chapter 2, verse 12, perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? There's another group who are mocking, verse 13, saying, well, they're just full of new wine. They're drunk. <laughs> Peter stands up with the eleven, raises his voice, and he begins to explain what has happened at Pentecost. The first thing he says is, wait a second, they're not drunk, it's only 9 a.m. I mean, I know some guys that like to drink, but it's just 9 a.m. They're not drunk. And then he begins to speak the words of the prophet Joel. He says, what you all know and what you all have read, what you all studied at Sabbath school, this is what is happening now. The prophet Joel spoke about it. That's verse 17 through 21. You get to, down to 22. And then he mentions Jesus. And he says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Do you see how he wrote that? How Luke wrote that? How Peter had, was quoted saying this. That Jesus was a man. As he walked this earth, he was a man. And that's why we say Jesus did what he did, not because he was God, although we believe he was God, we believe in eternity. Jesus did what he did in the flesh because he was a man filled with the Spirit of God. And this confirms that. He is a man attested to you by, by God, to you by miracles, signs, and wonders that God did through him. God did through Jesus. So if God did them through Jesus, shouldn't God do them through you? Well, the taste test tells us who's doing it in and through you. The taste test of oil tells us who's doing it in and through you. So Peter goes on and explains the whole bleeding, suffering, dying, resurrected cross thing, right? 22, 23, 24, God raised him up. 25, he goes in and talks about a psalm with David. How he links Jesus to David. And Peter continues to explain what has happened at Pentecost. The resurrection of Christ. How Jesus, uh, God is raised up. Verse 33. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. This outpouring of the Holy Spirit, this outpouring of the oil is what you've been told about, what you've been, been trained about. Now it's happened. It's right here. This is the picture of the kingdom. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know, assuredly, verse 36, that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. The Jesus that was crucified, that was resurrected, this Jesus is both Lord and Messiah. Now look what happens in verse 37. Remember we said that the 
sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. And we said in Hebrews 4.12 that the Word of God is living and powerful. Sharper than a double-edged sword. So when you get to 2.37, what's happening here? Now when they heard this, those who were wondering what's happening, they heard this, they heard Peter's explanation of Pentecost, they were what? Cut to the heart. That's what the sword does. It cuts to the heart. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? What must we do? Do you see that's a responsive question. What do you want me to do? Same thing Paul said on his road to Damascus. And I've translated that to say, What do you want to do, Jesus, in and through me? Because they know something's got... They've been cut to the heart. There's a their confrontation. There's a crisis moment here. There's a dividing between truth and deception. Yes. Righteousness and unrighteousness. Between the wise and the foolish. And that's the cutting that takes place. So what's Peter say? Well, give me $55 and uh, buy this book and you're all set to go. <laughs> no. no. Recite these, you know... Five self-help things and you're, you're good to go. What's he saying? Repent. Go to the cross, man. Go to the cross. Yeah. Woo. Repent. Yeah. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off. As many as the Lord our God will call. Hey, you got a kid you've been praying for? The first question is, well, why God haven't you let them to you? The first question, what you can do something about, your response is, have you got my heart first and foremost, God? Yes. Have you got my heart? I mean, I want you to get my kid's heart, but do you have my heart? That's the order with, with which he speaks it here. And with many other words... Of course, it's Peter. He testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Back then it was a perverted generation. Well, what do you think about it now? Yeah. Things haven't changed. Why do we keep thinking they're going to change? We don't need change. We need transformation. Amen. Then those who gladly received, those who took their oil with their lamps. Come on. Those who received his word were baptized. And that day 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostle doctrine. We're we'll talking about that next time though. They received. They received. They embraced. They repented. They gave up. It fell on their faces. They denied themselves. They took up their cross. They followed Jesus. Woo! They took their oil. They offered themselves living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto God. Does it sound familiar? Amen. I'm just repeating scripture here. Yes, yes. Lord. They feared the Lord <laughs> and shunned evil. There's another group. Chapter 7. Uh, this is my, this uh, apostle's name is Stephen. He's probably not he's an apostle, I guess, but he's not one of the original 12. But he was chosen because he was good looking. You should say, no, that's not right. Okay, I'm just testing, making sure you're listening. He wasn't chosen because he was good looking. He was chosen because he was what? A man full of the Holy Spirit. That's why he was chosen. So he had good fruit. He received the oil. He was chosen. Some think he was just chosen to wait on tables and you know take care of the widows and orphans. But somehow, 
you get to chapter 6 and 7, uh, Stephen now is in the midst of this um, theological debate and discussion. Now he's preaching Jesus in chapter 7. And he gives the church, and the high priest is there, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the scribes are probably all there as well. And he gives them this history lesson. He tells them in his sermon here everything going back to Father Abraham and all that was going on and, and Moses and Jacob and Joseph and you just you know you can read that later. All that has happened in their history. And, and isn't it interesting? He takes all of that. He, he reminds them of, of what happened. Uh, the days where they, they made a calf, verse 41, offered sacrifices to idols. See, he doesn't have your heart when you do things like this. God doesn't have my heart when I'm involved in idol worship. I, I'm not a, uh, a confused Christian, okay? No, don't, don't mix these words, okay? He doesn't have my heart. And I'm not a Christian until he has my heart. Oh, no, only two. Yeah. Try it again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When he has my heart, then I'm a Christian. <laughs> Three. Okay, we're getting there. <laughs> All right. They don't like that one. Woo! All right, well, I'm Amen. just... <clears throat> so they made, made this calf, golden, and, you know, rejoiced. And what does it say? Verse 41. They rejoiced in their own worth. I'm giving you so much. That's, I'm sorry, but it was just... It was a last-minute thing. Not my fault. <laughs> Verse 41. They rejoiced in their own works. What did Hebrews say? That they ceased from their own works. You see the difference here? See how this all ties in? I mean, we've just... They rejoiced in their own works. Hebrews says when you enter in, you cease from your own works. Which tells me, these, these church folk have not entered into Him. They're Pharisees. They're Sadducees. They wear the garb. They put it on their heads. They quote the scripture. They tell you how you should live. They made up more laws. They did everything but let Him enter. They rejoiced in their own works. Your fathers rejoice in your own works. And you guys are living just like your fathers. Whoa. You get down around uh, verse 44. Our fathers had built the tabernacle of a witness in the wilderness. As he appointed, instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen. Which your fathers have received in turn, also bought with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David, who found favor before God and asked to find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. Verse 47. But Solomon built him a house. Verse 48. Stephen says, However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands. As the prophet says, right. heaven is my throne. That's out of Amos. Earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Wow. Has my hand not made all these things? Wow. Okay, let's get this right now. It's, it's really confusing, isn't it? No, it's not. You're the house. <laughs> He's going to rest in you. If he's not resting in you, you can't rest. Amen. He's the light that makes you the light. Well, you're not the light, but he's the light in you. And him in you makes you the light. Woo! So, Jesus in you makes you a Christian. Yes. <laughs> and without him in you, you can't be a Christian. That's right. So quit lying to people. That's right. <laughs> and the only thing that's going to be okay is if they get to the cross and die. Amen. So they can be born again. Lord. Yeah. Quit telling us it's going to be okay. Just pray a little harder. Just give a little more. Praise God. Yeah. That's not the truth. Praise Lord. The truth is he's got to win your heart. Amen. And if he only really wins your heart, and you're lost. That's Praise right. Amen. We're absolutely lost. Praise 
You can come every Sunday till Jesus comes back. And you'll be lost if he doesn't have your heart. That's the test. Here's the perfect picture. Thousands of years of the church, of the Jewish people, got all caught up in their own works. And look at Stephen's call to them. Well, it'll be okay, verse 51. It'll be all right. I mean, you guys know more than me. I mean, your history books, you know, you guys, I mean, look at the way you're dressed. You obviously must know more than me. Verse 51. Here's Stephen, this waiter at the table, this one who's not even the original 12. Come on. What authority does he have? He's, he's got his heart. Jesus. Praise God. Stephen's not preaching. Oh, no, it's Stephen. God is speaking in and through Stephen. Yes. And he calls it, You stiff neck and uncircumcised and heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did so to you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute, as they killed those who foretold of the coming of the just one? of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers, who you have received the law by the direction of angels and not have kept it. Verse 54. When they heard these things, chapter 2, when they heard these things, they ran to the cross. Nah. When they heard these things for Stephen, they ran at him. Yes. <laughs> Stiff neck, hard heart, and plugged ear. They were cut to the heart. They gnashed at him with their teeth. Whoa, that's a nightmare in itself. <laughs> and Stephen picked up his club and he began to beat the tar out of these crazies. <laughs> Stephen said, hey, wait a minute, I'm packing. Well, yeah, he's packing the Holy Spirit. Woo! Verse 55. He's received the oil. And Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven, saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. He had a picture lesson for him, too. Well, if you're not listening to my words, at least just look up here. I'll, I'll show you. God himself is going to reveal himself to you. But they were so stuck. In their ways, so stuck in their stiff neck, hard heart, and plugged ears, that they couldn't even see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But that's nothing new for them. He's been standing in front of them for three and a half years. Wouldn't it be something? Jesus would be standing right before you. And you are so caught up in whatever. Your, your past. So caught up in the way that you think church should be. So caught up in the emotions of it. So caught up in, in whatever. So caught up that you forgot to take your oil. So caught up in, well, I'm not going to prepare. Look at the test. The taste test. Wait, guys. Jesus, he says, right here. And they cried out with a loud voice, and they, they stopped their ears. They chose not to listen. And they ran at Stephen with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and they stoned him. And then we look at Stephen and say, Wow. Young life taken way too early. Way too early. Oh, he didn't get to fulfill God's purpose. 
Do you think that? No. Keep on reading. There was a man named Saul who was standing right there. You don't think that affected him in any way? Wow. Steve in the doormat. Paul get all the credit? Maybe by some theologians who are misguided, I might add. Yes. Well, when you get to heaven, no. Stephen, Paul. Church might do this. Kingdom of heaven is like this. Jesus, would we taste and see that you are good? Would we this day? I mean, the only... Have you won our hearts? Have we given you our hearts? You won my heart. I, I got questions, Jesus, about what's going on in my life. Well, give yourself to Jesus. I got questions about my marriage, Jesus. My wife, she just doesn't listen to me. Give yourself to Jesus, man. Give yourself to Jesus. My kids, I don't know why they don't listen. I don't know why they don't understand. Give yourself to Jesus. It starts with you. My job, oh, my job, man. It's my boss, my, my boss and my, my co-workers. And, oh, what's the purpose? What's the, what is the deal here? Give yourself to Jesus. I've been inviting people and inviting people and I don't know why they don't come and hey, they just don't listen and you know I just look at their life. Hey man, don't look at them. Give yourself to Jesus. Give yourself to Jesus. Has He won your heart? The taste test of life tells you and everyone around you if He's won your heart. Men and, men and brethren, what shall we do? Repent. Turn your back on the old way and embrace the new way. Give yourself to Jesus. It's the way of life in the kingdom. Continually denying yourself. And taking up your cross. And walking as He walked. To the places where he walked. Let's give ourselves to Jesus. I mean, it's, it's cut and dry here. The sword separates here. We can see the sheep and we can see the, the goats. And doesn't it make you... Do you see the ones who responded... They weren't the ones hanging out in church their whole lives. And the ones who rejected, they were the ones who were hanging out in church their whole lives. Come and give yourself to Jesus. March yourself up this aisle and fall on your face so that you know that He's got your heart because if he doesn't have your heart, nothing else really matters. Amen. If you have a question about your future, if you have one question about your future, you better make sure he's got your heart. If you've got something in your past that continues to gnaw at you, you have got to give him your heart. Because that's where the center of your existence is, right in the center of your heart. You keep your hurts there, you keep your pain there, you keep your dreams there. All that possesses you is kept in your heart. And he's got to be the Lord. Those who have entered His rest cease from their own works.
And you won my heart. What's he have to do? What more does he have to do to win your heart? It's been finished. What more does he have to do to win your heart? You will notice that there was a response to both parts of this taste test. Both groups responded. One we called, said, one responded in chapter 2, the other rejected. But both, both are responses. One embraced, one rejected. So we have to do the same. We've got to do the same. Your best will never be good enough for the kingdom. Your talents will never be good enough to get into the kingdom. Your money, not enough. Your fame, not enough. He's got to have your heart. So let's respond together and proclaim together that he's won our hearts. So Jesus, that's what we're going to do. These closing moments, we're going to respond together. At this place we call altars, because we look back and see that's where the sacrifices were made at these altars. Sacrifice of praise. Abraham put Isaac on the altar. Paul said, offer yourself living sacrifices. So you can transform us from the inside out. So we'll respond together in our giving. We'll respond together in our in our worship, respond together in our cry out to you. We say yes to you, Jesus.